Sometimes he claimed that his mother's husband was not his father and that he was of noble descent, the natural son of a Polish count. Alternatively, he was the son of a painter or an officer with a girl in every garrison. He often signed himself Josef Roth, former lieutenant in the 24th Lancers of the Imperial Royal Army. He insisted that when Franz Josef was buried, he had been part of the military escort. He spoke of being captured and transported to the Eastern Front in the Great War and of serving time as a prisoner of war in Siberia. He said that for his military achievements, he'd been decorated with the Silver Medal of the Order of Charles I. Not one of those statements is true. It all started about 35 years ago. I was making a film in Vienna with the writer Michael Frame, and I didn't know very much about Vienna at that time. I'd never been before we started making that film together, and um, I did a bit of background research. I thought, well, we're talking about Vienna at the turn of the 20th century. The Habsburg Empire was still a reality at that time. I'd better do some background reading. And amongst my background reading, um, I picked up Rodetsky March by Josef Roth. And I had heard of him, I'd never read a word of him. I opened the book, I think I read it at a sitting, um, and I was utterly seduced by it. And what seduced me was the fact that it promised an epic story and then broke the promise within five minutes of starting to read. And what it told you instead was an anti-epic narrative. It was a story of a world perceived upside down from the wrong end of a telescope. And what captivated me about it, first of all, was the way he portrayed that world and the kind of language he portrayed it in, but also just the world itself. I'd never been there, and I wanted to go there. My starting point for the journey was that reading of Rudetsky March, which I was doing in Vienna 35 years ago. And so, in a way, what the book grew from was the same the same starting point, the idea of a world perceived through a particular sensibility at a particular time. Uh, the phrase that people use for it is psychogeography. In other words, it is the relationship between the inner world of Josef Roth and the outer world that he inhabited. Um, he indeed was an Austrian writer, but the Austria that he was born in uh, is actually not Austria anymore. It's uh, uh, the Western Ukraine. It's part of um, what once was the Soviet Union. Um, he wrote predominantly between the two wars. He was a writer who described the end of a world. The world that he described ending was the world of the three empires that uh, collapsed as a result of the First World War. He's a German writer who actually has a Slavic sensibility and the sentences are terse, they're magical, they uh, they are quite unlike what everybody thinks of as German fiction. So again, that was another feeling about, you know, this is a, this is, this is a journey through terra incognita. It's a journey through a great writer's mental landscape, but a great writer who is remarkably unregarded. And I got that feel that all the lies, all the fabrications, all the fantasy, all the alternative worlds that he creates were really a reality to substitute for the real reality in which he had actually grown up. I mean, the, bo the book is called Wandering Jew because he was a Jew and he wandered. Um, he was a Jew coming from a place that is of great significance to scholars of Jewish Hasidic Orthodox history. Um, the town of Brody, uh, had 60% Jewish population. It was a shtetl. My own family comes from a uh, shtetl on my mother's side, uh, which is about 300 kilometers to the north of where Josef Roth was born and grew up. So there is that connection with that shtetl world, if you like, that I know came from my grandparents. And therefore, when I arrived in Josef Roth's landscape, I had a sense in which I'd kind of already been there, or my DNA had already been there. Rote refused ever to buy and live in a house. He lived in um, hotels all his life. Uh, by the time he was in his mid-thirties, his wife was already exhibiting the signs of the schizophrenia which uh, 
ended with her incarceration in the Steinhoff Mental Hospital, and then subsequently she died um, in the Holocaust when they uh, wiped out Jewish mental patients. So his life started to disintegrate in a way personally from the beginning of the 1930s onwards, although he was actually very successful as a writer until the rise of the Nazis. He'd already prophesied what was going to happen to uh, the German-speaking world as early as 1922 in his first um, novel. Um, and what he saw was his prophecies being fulfilled, not, not just in Germany, but also in Russia as well. He visited Russia again in the early years, early post-revolutionary years. He'd, he'd met Trotsky, or at least we think he'd met Trotsky. You never quite know with Joseph Brook whether these things actually happened or not. I spent most of my professional life in uh, film and television, and the short film, 60-minute format, is a very natural one to me. But words have always mattered to me as well. I worked with writers like Michael Frayn, um, so you know the nature of the words matters. Um, when I was uh, asked to write this book. Uh, because of the fact that it's an essay, because of the fact that it's only a hundred and something pages long, it enabled me to create not a, you know, cradle to grave biography, but something that could work in the same way as if I had been making a film on the subject, that could actually juxtapose past and present, that could juxtapose life and work, in a way that wasn't plodding academically through it, but was actually giving you glimpses, uh, flashes and so on, rather than a worked through solid narrative.